So it is my pleasure this afternoon to give you an update of the activities that have occurred since last we've met. It's been a pretty busy period of time. Also keeping in mind that uh, we haven't actually met for about six months now. Normally we meet every three months, but because of the intervention of Mother Nature, last January we did do, we took care of the um, closed session activities, but we did not engage in the open session activities. So we have, at, at your request and, and ours too, been able to, re, um, to sort of recreate the council open session council that we would have had in January. Um, so we appreciate your understanding and also appreciate the council members' forbearance with uh, our, in helping us get through that council on closed session. We sometimes talk about how we'd really like to do, so we should do more by remote. And I resisted a bit on the council because it, there's so many things that happen in the face-to-face -face, uh, communications and all the side meetings, et cetera. But um, this was an experiment and it was an interesting one with about 18 different types of, and levels of technology, plus our own technology in the various buildings. So, so we, we thought it was an interesting experiment and thank you for your forbearance. Uh, so moving on, today I will give you a budget update uh, as much as we know at this particular time. Talk a little bit about um, what's happening in, in the department HHS and NIH uh, wide as well as an update from NINR and some of the latest news that's been happening here. Well, Washington is always a busy and exciting place to be. It gets more exciting by the minute. We have actually an enormous number of activities going on and we're anticipating uh, the increasing drumbeats as we approach the uh, November deadlines. Um, we um, have had many interactions with Congress. We've had just a great deal more activity than usual. Um, it, we are in approaching a transition, as, as you know, as the parties change. Um, and we really um, are not a, an overly political agency, but because we are part of the executive branch of the government, any changes in the overall government do affect us. So it's been a very interesting time. Those of you who are um, C-SPAN junkies probably know as much about it um, as uh, as the rest of us do. But, but suffice to say, we do not yet have a budget this year. Um, and that is, um, in recent years, that is that's not unusual, but there's a great deal of activity going on on the Hill. This shows you a trend of uh, our current budget, what we know about it, and, and our previous years. So we do the president's budget is approximately a break-even budget for us this year, um, and a little bit um, additional for um, NIH in that the additional funds um, tend to be specifically designated for certain areas. Um, for, um, uh, for example, for the Precision Medicine Initiative, for the Moonshot, um, for Alzheimer's disease research, and a, a few other things that, that you have, have heard about or read about. So that's the President's budget. Now, as you know, Congress ultimately will vote on their budget bill. So we wait for the House and for the Senate and for the conference bill. So at this point in time, we don't know. There is a, a great deal of positive activity going on, on the Hill. There is an enormous amount of expression of goodwill and underscoring of the importance of what we do, of what um, NIH does and what the medical researcher the, and all the health research is accomplishing. But we don't have um, concrete uh, numbers to give you. And we may not for some time, um, but we uh, await um, the outcomes of the deliberations and, and hope that we will have a bill. Because it is an election year, there is a fair amount of sentiment that we might have a bill before we get too much closer um, to the election time. So um, when we have the current budget and, and our, our budget um, allocations, um, look very much like this profile. And this is something that I've shown you before, but there is not a great deal of change in the large segments. These are the segments and the um, allocations are approximately in this regard. So that you can see if you add up the RPGs, which are the, the R series grants, the centers, the other research, which is primarily composed of Ks, um, and also the training, and about half of the R&D, that a little more than 80% of all of our funds go out to the extramural community for to support research um, grants and training. Uh, approximately 6% stays intramurally. Our intramural program 
and you'll hear from the program um, again in September, but our program is about, the average program across the NIH is 10 to 11% of their budget. So our program is a bit smaller than the others, but it is robust and um, has a number of uh, very um, outstanding characteristics about it. The um, RMS is the sort of internal working, it's kind of like your overhead, your overhead's about 28 to 32 percent. Ours is roughly 11. Um, and that supports all of the grants activity that goes on, all the review that takes place, all the kinds of, um, the kinds of requirements that you have in order to, to fulfill, in order to have a grant award made. The, on our end, that's, that's part of what the overhead is here. Um, and so we do, um, you know, we do tend to send most of our funds out. So, so the news about the budget is the more that comes our way, the more that comes your way. So um, now moving on to some of the uh, interesting things that have been happening in the department. Um, and the department has announced actually that we're we have only a few months left to get things accomplished. Uh, there they have a few months left to get things accomplished, so we're full steam ahead. So uh, indeed, we are very active. Um, it's very busy uh, in a good way. So the um, Department of Health and Human Services has announced the National Pain Strategy. This is the first national pain strategy that has been developed, and it does. Um, it's a comprehensive. Uh, look at pain and the management of pain across populations. It has grown out of the efforts of the um, the uh, interagency pain Consor research consortium, the IPRCC, and that is um, uh, it is a consortium that's transgovernment, so it in includes not just NIH but AHRQ, Department of Defense, um, FDA, most of the agencies that have any interest in pain at all. In fact, all of the agencies in this general area are part of this um, the IPRCC, and there is a website that that will give you more detail. But, but it is really intended uh, to de devote its time to research and identifying research um, initiatives. But as a result of the uh, Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, report on pain in our populations, the, uh, there were a number of suggestions in that report. And one of those suggestions was to develop a national pain strategy. <clears throat> and the Assistant Secretary of Health, Howard Coe, felt that this was particularly important as did we all, but it wasn't something that was normally part of our mandate. And so, um, <clears throat> but he asked NIH and the IPRCC to do that. And um, so we did, with the help of a number of uh, 80 to 100 some people, experts outside who helped us develop this. So it has been a, a large effort. It, it is, it has been vetted by a number of groups and has been open for comment and has now been released by the department. And it does give us a bit of a blueprint for moving forward across several areas, such as population health, such as even areas of reimbursement, which of course we're not expert in, but, but it does deal with so many of the aspects uh, that are important to patients and families who are experiencing pain. So, so we do. We're proud of the effort, and um, invite you to to uh, go through that. <clears throat> Also, the Senate has confirmed uh, Dr. Rob Califf as the FDA commissioner. Uh, for those of you who don't know Rob, he's been very active. He comes from Duke um, and established a Center for Translational Research and, um, and Clinical Trials um, in, in the Duke environment, but has been very active in the um, clinical trial arena, has been very active with NIH in helping us with our HMO collaboratory and a number of other efforts. And so he did come on board at FDA as a, a, a deputy commissioner for uh, translation and in clinical trials and has now been confirmed as the FDA commissioner. We've had several meetings with him since then. He comes to NIH frequently and is very committed to um, the idea of clinical trials and getting drugs to patients earlier safely, but, but in a very expeditious way. So he's a, a rather... Um, one of his particular skills is taking complicated things and, and streamlining them a bit. So, so we're very pleased. Um, he's in the HMO collaboratory. He's been instrumental in helping us do things like get single IRBs and things of that sort. So, so we look forward to some interesting things um, and fun things, too. He has quite a sense of humor. So moving a little closer to home. 
Um, Francis Collins, uh, as the director of NIH, has testified before Congress for the 2017 budget on both the House and the Senate side, and um, his testimony was well received. Congress is very excited about a number of the things that are going on, um, and um, and have been very um, laudatory about the scientific advancements. Um, uh, although we don't have any outcomes yet. Um, so one thing which is just hot off the press, so I'll, I'll give you the, um, the capsule of it, and, and then you can refer to our website for more information. But one of the things that has probably been percolating around in your universities, and, and all of you may not have <clears throat> know about this yet, but those of you um, who are at the, the dean level and, and uh, associate director for research have probably um, been anticipating it. Um, the, for the first time in quite a long, quite a number of years, the um, Fair Labor Standards Act has been revised, and it has been revised to raise the minimum wage so that people, or rather to address the issues of overtime. And one of the issues of overtime is that there is a minimum wage at which overtime people, uh, employers are exempt from paying overtime. And, and of course, there are certain um, individuals who are exempt from that. And most, uh, in general, executives are exempt, and postdocs, and, and so on and so so forth, and virtually almost everyone in the room <laughs> is exempt. Um, and but with raising the the minimum salary for the um, Fair Labor Standards Act to kick in, meant that. Um, that postdocs then would be um, eligible for overtime. Uh, what in, in fact happened instead, uh, and as well as a number of others, but so what? So this will impact the postdocs um, across the country, postdocs that are on grants, postdocs that we fund. We actually had already been working on and and did. Um, raise the salaries of the postdocs. So, so they will get higher salaries. They will not, in, in that, if they, they will not qualify for the overtime, but they will get the higher salaries. Um, so that is, that's something that we will be doing with the NRSA mechanism. So the individual and, tra and um, uh, institutional training grants will have those higher stipends. Um, this is actually, we were pretty, pretty close on the mark as, as our, our long-term plan for raising those each year. I think we were off by $400. Um, but but um, So we were pretty close on those. But we do not control the salaries of the postdocs who are on grants, uh, any R1s or other grants uh, across the country. And so that's something that will, um, necessitate some uh, rearrangement um, in your home institutions. And we are not, a, at this point, we are not um, uh, sanctioned or we're not, uh, we're not allowed to rewrite the, the grants that you have to be able to do supplements for raising those salaries. So it is um, because they're on uh, training grants. And there's a, a definition of trainees uh, on training grants versus on a R01 type grant. So, so um, that's something that will affect most of the campuses across the country. Anyone who's uh, getting um, receiving research funds from us that have trainees on the the grants. So um, I want I'm happy to announce that um, Eric Dishman has been selected as the director of the Precision uh, Medicine Initiative cohort. Many of you have heard about the the PMI uh, initiative, and so he will be joining us um, around uh, end of July. In fact, he's at, but he's actually already on board in a way because he's been part of the working group. So he's very much um, invested in and involved in the activities that uh, go into the um, Precision Medicine Initiative. We have, um, so we're really looking forward to his coming on board and like to have him come to council as early as, as possible. He has um, a great deal of work awaiting him, but um, he, he's been so involved in that. He is a social scientist. He also comes to us most recently from Intel, where he was um, uh, overseeing a project very much like this in terms of patient cohorts and um, managing large um, data sets. So, so we feel that his background and his familiarity with the um, PMI working will be an enormous uh, asset to him when he comes on board, and he's extremely extremely enthusiastic, so we're looking forward to that. Also, Matthew Gilman has been selected as the ECHO Program Director. That's Environmental Effects on Children's Health Outcomes. And um, he, that's a seven-year project that has been, uh, has been mandated and, and funded by um, Congress. 
And it's recall we used to have a national childhood study, and those funds, um, since that study had ended, the funds could have gone back to Congress, and, and they've sort of been reallocated so that we can still look at children, but including the environment and looking at the environmental effects on um, children's um, health outcomes. And so he is um, has been actually um, part of the national children's study and part of the Framingham study and has a, a experience with a number of projects that will uh, qualify him quite well to take the leadership helm of this important position. Um, so he's coming to us um, from Harvard, and we expect him in August. Dr. Patricia Brennan has been selected as the director of the National Library of Medicine. Um, many of you will remember her as um, she's a professor um, in nursing and also engineering at the University of Wisconsin. Many of you will remember her from her um, talk to council about a year ago, 2014. And she has also been um, very instrumental in helping us develop our boot camps and in participating in those for two years. So we're very enthusiastic. She's excited. She will be coming in August as well. And she's very excited about coming. And we are also enthusiastic, wildly enthusiastic that she's coming, but, but also very pleased that her intramural efforts will become part of our intramural um, research program. So, and that is the, the standard here is if, if you are doing research and you, um, you can't control the resources for your own um, lab um, at the NIH. So, so um, Ann Cashin will um, be exerting some heavy muscle on her budget, I guess. Just, just kidding, Ann. Uh, but we, but we're delighted. Patty is really looking forward to it, and will be a wonderful addition. Also, just um, just this past week, um, Dr. Maureen Goodnow has been named Associate Director for AIDS Research and the Director of the um, of the Office of AIDS Research. Uh, at NIH. Now, recall that the AIDS appropriation is a separate appropriation. So when you see our budget, we give you the total budget. But there is an AIDS appropriation within that, so we give you the total. And and our program, our AIDS program, is roughly about 9 to 10% of our budget. So, so it is a substantial program for us. And over a period of the last year and a half, the um, AIDS advisory group and the advisory committee to the director have been meeting to look at the priorities in the field of AIDS, given that so much has changed. This has come from being a chronic um, uh, life-limiting disease to uh, a rather acute life-limiting to a chronic, more of a chronic illness. And, and many of the um, medications that have been de developed are have been successful or at least helpful in maintaining um, the, the chronic portion of the illness and, and, and also helping to normalize lifestyles. So in view of the uh, changing, altering scientific demands, the uh, advisory groups did take a look at that. And so there is a list of the priorities on the website. It's in great detail. And I would um, advise all of you, I know Rebecca Henry is talking to all of the people who are who are uh, scientists in the area um, about those priorities, just to make sure that everyone is acquainted with them and that you are writing your applications directed toward w those priorities. Um, so it's um, so far has been a reasonably smooth transition, but we're just working to um, make certain that it keeps that way. And and so Maureen has a very long history of fun of working in the area of AIDS and being funded in that area. Um, and she also comes to us from Harvard. Um, we like to have you um, as council members uh, and all of our constituents make certain that when you look for the um, funding announcements, uh, that you also look at the NIH-wide funding announcements in addition to the ones that are specific to NINR. And so this is a list of the current um, funding announcements and opportunities that, that are the most relevant um, to our science. And as you see, these typically... Typically, funding announcements are viable. Um, they have a lifespan of three years. Uh, and so at that point, they can be either renewed or they just go off the, off the list. Um, and there are exceptions to that, of course, are RFAs. But, but these are our funding announcements. OK. So moving a little bit closer to home. What's been happening here? Well, quite a bit. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, once again welcome our new council members. Um, we're very happy to have you here um, to join the council. You have been selected because of your scientific expertise and also your um, uh, leadership activities in the community. And as I was saying this morning, we select you because of your specific expertise, and then we ask you to become a little bit of a generalist to be able to look at the, the broad brush of um, scientific studies. 
So uh, we say a sad goodbye to the retiring council members. And, um, and unfortunately, the retiring council members, because of the weather, we were unable to feed them at the dinner um, and to present their uh, certificates and, and um, tokens of appreciation. And so I, so I have their pictures up just to remind us that even though they're absent, that they're gone but not forgotten. Um, and, and Michael, actually, Michael Schlicker. <laughs> Sorry, did that? That may not have come out the way I did it. <laughs> but Michael is actually still here. He's he's toughing it out for one more meeting. So his term, because he, his term was a little bit out of sync with the others, and that's fine. Um, so, um, but we so we'll um, do a little presentation for him tomorrow after we finish, uh, since it's not part of our um, council agenda. Okay. Um, also, I mentioned uh, just a few moments ago the the NINR directors lecture and lectures, and we do have four of those a year. They are placed on they are placed on, archived and placed on on the uh, available on the website for viewing. and And so, Catherine Bowles was here March third, and uh, Marie Nolan just recently May fifth. And uh, we they were very well received. We had almost a full house. Um, recently, and these are big auditoriums. Um, but we do put those on the website so that you can, it, we understand everybody can't be here for an hour in the middle of the day, and uh, it's a long way to travel for an hour lecture for most of you. But but they are really um, very, we have had been lucky, we've been fortunate to have such talented people. So they're really um, wonderful lectures, and they're really good for teaching, too, to be able to talk about a program of research and some of the successes that, that these folks have, um, have uh, achieved and some of the struggles and some of the process. And I think what is most interesting to me is to watch, you know, when you look at a career in full flower, you go, wow, how did they ever do that? And as they explain, as they go through, it's very nice to be able to see some of the steps that lead to this level of success. And so, so um, I would uh, suggest it, uh, that you view them, of course, but also to uh, make your students aware. So we have a number of other events that are coming up uh, for anniversary, um, and I, we invite you to all of them. And, and as is our habit, we will, uh, we do video and, um, and maintain and, and archive most of, of the events that we have now. Um, and so we have our NINR director's lecture. The next one is going to be September 13th, and that's in conjunction with our anniversary celebration and also the state of the science. And it is going to be given by Ellen Goodman. And she is an expert in the end of life, but she has written a book and is, has actually founded an a organization about conversations. And, it, and it's uh, her, actually her, the title of the book is the conversation, or title of her talk is The Conversations We're Not Having. And it is about addressing issues around end of life and palliative care. And she um, is well known as an organizer, uh, outstanding speaker, and um, as a, a bit of a humorist. And so I'm not, I'm not, it's not a humorous topic. So we'll, we'll see how um, she handles that. But, but um, she is uh, very well known in the field. So we're looking forward to that. Also, the scientific symposium closing our year of celebration uh, for the 30th anniversary is uh, September 14th um, this year in the fall in Washington. And that is just actually for you council members, it's just after council downtown and right before the state of the science. So it's all dovetailed, as you might say. Things are all like close, but but it's all doable. Uh, and then the final uh, lectures, uh, director's lecture for the year will be November 1st. So these are all upcoming, and we invite you to any and all of these, um, either in person or by the telewaves. Um, the National Nursing Research Roundtable, we have um, once a year as a gathering of the organizations who have research as a major part of their mission. And so this year um, w it uh, took place on March 3rd and 4th, and it was um, focused on improving symptom outcomes for persons with complex chronic conditions through continuity of care. So the focus really was on continuity, and uh, which is a, uh, very appropriate given the um, work that has led to the transitional care reimbursement um, in the ACA and many other areas. So, so this was the Emergency Nurses Association, and was um, you know very uh, very successful. A paper will be coming out in about a month and a half. Um, 
We also had the center's directors, center directors meetings, and this is an annual meeting of center directors, which is a very robust and enthusiastic group who are pioneering for us in the area of common data elements. But this particular meeting was focused on exploring biomarkers for self-management and symptom science. And again, that paper will be um, forthcoming um, in about within the next month and a half, I believe. We also have um, phase two of our campaign on Conversations Matter, palliative care pediatric populations, has been launched. Uh, recall the first phase addressed Conversations Matter, but also was directed more toward the healthcare providers. This Portion, this uh, part of the campaign is directed toward uh, patients and their families. And so it is, and also the materials are now available in Spanish as well as English. Um, so we did, in order to um, get the word out on this, we did a radio media tour on uh, May 11th. Um, and that was about, I, I did 14 radio interviews in about four hours. So it was a very, there was a very robust response. We said, we said four hours, actually it extended a little bit further. Um, but there was um, a very um, robust response uh, on many of the um, the national uh, radio stations and and um, and all the various subsidiaries of NPR. So so you will probably hear sound bites of that. Um, the uh, science uh, policy and public liaison group is monitoring all of the uh, follow up. So I, I don't have that data yet. Um, we also have our, our website. We've added the Common Data Elements webpage. Uh, the center directors are pioneering the experiment using CDEs, and we're very enthusiastic about the, um, the ability to maximize the data that we collect. And it's really in combination with the big data efforts that are ongoing. I think this will help to increase the power of our studies. Um, they are doing the experiment, and so we'll um, keep posted on that experiment. But we also encourage everyone, we encourage all of our scientists to take a look at this page and to think about how this might apply for you, um, as well as um, reading the papers of the center director's discussions and activities. Our strategic plan uh, that we're currently operating under uh, was released in 2011. The new strategic plan is scheduled for release um, September of this year, 2016. You recall you ha had um, the opportunity to view that and, and to add your suggestions and, and, and revisions before we sent it out for public comment. And so we did, um, we had a number of comments from the public on it and have now incorporated all of those um, into that um, into the new document. And so it is scheduled for release um, uh, very soon. Uh, again, funding opportunities that are, are uh, operating right now that are still uh, viable include the following list. I won't read them to you, but just um, a reminder that we do have a number of these that are available for response. And then later this afternoon, as you know, we are we will be talking about the potential, uh, the concepts for potential upcoming announcements. Okay. Um, the training uh, training opportunities that um, uh, we have available to you um, include the Summer Genetics Institute, which starts uh, June 1st this year. It is, um, as always, uh, subscribes fairly quickly. And I actually talked, we have one, one of our visitors today is a graduate of that um, uh, SGI program. And I'm happy to say that she said in the two years since she's taken the course, it has been extremely useful. Um, the intent is to uh, incorporate that information to be able to, uh, to thread it through your research programs, uh, your uh, teaching and curriculum, and also um, clinical practices. So there are over th now a total of over 350 graduates of the program. Our, our newer uh, venue in the training, uh, the Me NINR Methodologies Boot Camp, this year we'll be looking at precision health from omics to data science. Recall this is our one week uh, intense uh, training program that is designed to uh, designed to bring people up to speed in terms of the latest measurement approaches for um, for studying symptoms. And this, so we started with, recall we started with pain, and then we moved on to, we rotated to sleep and fatigue, and then we've rotated from that to um, big data and the precision health aspect. So so it, it these, I always say these um, fill up quite quickly, so I don't even want to tell you how quickly it filled up this year because we have to figure out how to, how to do a lottery so that more of you can have access to it. It's almost impossible to get in now. Uh, 
I'd like to uh, brag just a little bit about um, our, our staff uh, and the particularly the um, uh, currently the the new activities in intramural the postdocs. We have um, Kristen Filler Dickinson just received a Pathway to Independence Award at K99R00. She's doing her postdoc um, in the area of fatigue in cancer patients. She is and the effects of oxidative stress. And she is our first um, K99 recipient in the intramural program. So we're very excited about that. She's a graduate of the graduate partnership program and really liked what she was doing uh, for her thesis work and applied for this um, fellowship and has received it. So, so we um, are very excited on her behalf. Also, one of our IRTA fellows, uh, Ani Ozoli, um, just uh, received first place uh, for her poster, first place award at the ENRS meeting, which is really spectacular. I mean, she's an uh, undergraduate, she's post back, and uh, is very excited, uh, very enthusiastic about her research. Um, and she's working in the area of GI distress. And so she's extremely um, enthusiastic. And so we think she's going to go on and get her PhD and maybe come back. Um, so, so other staff news, we have a lot of exciting things happening. Um, Dr. Nara Gavini has been selected as chief, our Office of Extramural Programs. And if you'd like to just stand for a second so people can see where to get you. Uh, uh, so Dr. Gavini has joined us. He's been here all of three weeks and uh, <laughs> he's really hit the ground running. <laughs> it's like, thank you, Nara. So hit the ground running. Uh, his uh, background, actually, he comes from uh, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. I, I see that Dr. Gibbons has just arrived. So sorry, Gary. You know, just uh, anyway. I know, yeah. I know you'll get one of ours. Okay, I get it. Um, but Nara uh, was a program uh, program uh, director in uh, NHLBI, and and prior to coming to uh, to NIH, he was a chairman of a department. His background is in, in biology, and he's um, he's very enthusiastic. I, I said, so what is the most interesting thing about this position? And he said, well, you know, I really like managing people, and so I thought, okay, that's. It's not always what you hear, uh, so we like to welcome like to welcome him on board. Um, also, we have some new program staff. We're very pleased um, to introduce Dr. Michelle Hamlet, who is also sitting in the back, um, and Michelle. Um, has a, a basic background. Um, she's very, um, in fact, she has her PhD from Harvard. Um, she um, has come to us from the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, where she was in charge of their training programs and also um, some of the diversity programs that they have as well. And she, so she's a very experienced program uh, director, and we're really pleased to have her join us. Um, also, Rebecca Roof, who's in the back also. So uh, Rebecca is um, has joined us from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, a place I'm very familiar with. Um, and uh, she also has been at NIH two years, roughly. And so she, um, but um, has, um, you know, comes with a neuroscience background. And, and so we're very pleased that she will be, um, that has she's joined us as a program director as well. And so we um, are welcome all all of you, and so feel free on the break to talk to them, and um, and probably because they're still relatively new, don't hit them with the really hard questions. But uh, although I'm sure they could answer them. <laughs> Okay. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close my remarks and just say that we do have a great deal of more information for you, but we've put the rest of the uh, activities and things on a handout, and the handouts are near the door. For those of you around the table, they, they should be in your book, but, but please um, help yourself to any handouts. And also on the break, feel free to ask us any questions, um, that um, anything you would like. And with that, I'll close with our website, inviting you to visit early and often because we are constantly adding information and making changes. And so the programs that I've alluded to this afternoon, uh, any more information that you wish um, will be available on the website. And as always, we're available for questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>